React is a, is a framework that allows you to build user interfaces in a way that is a lot more predictable, a lot more declarative. When React came out, it was marketed as declarative views. And for a long time, it was one of the main selling points on the official website. But you know what else is declarative? HTML. And we've been building UIs with it since the very beginning of web. So how React is more declarative? And why it matters? To answer this, we'll need to understand the false battle of imperative versus declarative, the marketing promise of declarative views, and why state is the root of all evil. Finally, what Dijkstra understood about the human brain and how it's reflected in the React design. There is a lot of confusion about what declarative and imperative mean. Originally, these terms come from programming language theory, where they represent the two main paradigms from which many others stem. Interestingly, declarative is often defined as the exact opposite of imperative. And some researchers define very strict rules for what it means for a language to be declarative, such as non-destructive verbal assignments or no side effects. But in reality, many different programming languages mix different paradigms. In JavaScript, for example, you can write both functional declarative and object-oriented imperative code. So it probably makes sense to have a very precise definitions for language classification. But in the context of programming styles, the boundary between the two becomes blurry. And to prove it, I will show you two examples, one in natural language and one in code. The most popular definition of declarative is that it describes what and imperative describes how. So I can declaratively say what I want, please get me some milk, but imperatively, I don't state the final outcome. Instead, I list all the steps necessary. Walk to the store, find the milk, pay for the milk, return home with it. What examples on the web often miss is that each of those imperative instructions is also quite declarative. You could split the pay for the milk step into eight distinct steps. So in natural language, it's actually pretty hard to draw a clear line between those two styles. And what about the code? The classic, very popular example is the for loop versus the map function. To double each number in a given array, the for loop defines a lot of things to make the job done. An accumulator, an iterator, a starting point, a condition, an iteration expression, and a body with our executable statement. In contrast, the map function simply says to map through the array and apply the same statement. So map is often referred to as the counterpart to the for loop. But we can again argue that neither of them is 100% declarative nor imperative. We could go one level lower than the for loop. For example, in classic compiled languages like C, we can imagine a possible assembly language translation for the for loop that will include more explicit memory allocation, moving the data between memory and registers, bitwise operations, labels for the start and end of the loop, and explicit jumping between those labels. You can see that assembly is much more verbose, steps are more precise. So this is now imperative, and by comparison, C becomes more declarative. It's only a matter of perception and context. On the other hand, we often move between imperative and declarative while writing in the same language. We just go the opposite direction, up. So one level higher in the abstraction would be to simply wrap our map function in another function, like double. Then we just call this function with an array as an argument. Now we have abstracted away the multiplication operation and the fact that we are using map function. Effectively, we have moved from more imperative to more declarative approach. And to capture this idea more visually, more implementation means more imperative and more abstraction means more declarative. Let that sink in. React is a, is a framework that allows you to build user interfaces in a way that is a lot more predictable, a lot more declarative. So early marketing of React says it's a lot more declarative. But we already know that HTML is also declarative. So what's the difference? Or was it just the marketing BS? Turns out there is a subtle and at the same time very significant syntax difference. In HTML, you have to write the contents of each tag at the time you write it. While in JSX, you can nest variables into the HTML tags. So HTML represents declarative static content, while JSX represents declarative dynamic content. And why is that important? Because processes that are spread out over time are very difficult for humans to understand and hold in their head. 
just these imperative actions that mutate state. It's very difficult for you to figure out what that state is at the end of that sequence of mutations. Um, and I'm not the first person to discover this. Uh, Dijkstra has a really great quote about this. He says, we should do our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process so that uh, to make the correspondence between the program and the process as trivial as possible. This still might feel a little bit abstract, so to make sense of it, let's go back in time a bit and see how frontend was written before declarative libraries. So imagine you have a to-do list, there is an input field, add button, and a list of items. And this is a declarative description of the UI in HTML, plus some JS to handle the add event. In vanilla JS, we have to use imperative DOM operations to make things happen. So we need to look for the input element and read its value, create a new li element for our new to-do item, attach the text from the input to this li element, look for the list element in the DOM, and append our new to-do item to this existing list. It doesn't look that terrible yet, but of course our app will grow over time. Now we also want to display the total count of items, so we have to get all the list elements and count them, then also find the title DOM element and update it with the total count. Next day, next feature, for whatever reason, we also want to display the last item's name in the corner. So again, our handler needs to find the DOM element and update it with the new name. The problem is that our state is spread across three different places in the DOM itself. Each DOM node acts as a separate state container. So every time we add a new element to our static HTML, we must remember to update it in our existing event handlers. And if the number of possible actions in the app grows, we'll have to remember about each state for every event handler. And if you forget to update just one place, the entire app can become unsynchronized. And this is exactly what the Facebook team was struggling with in 2011. Here is a great clip describing how UI can easily grow in complexity. We knew that we had a problem with chat in 2011 when we introduced the subscribe button on our blog. And the first comment on that blog post was, please improve chat system with 898 likes. So how do we get to this place? Well, to answer that, we have to go through sort of um, the chat feature as it evolved. We started with something pretty simple. You have a chat tab, shows a list of messages. Whenever you want to, uh, whenever you get a new chat message, you just append it. It's pretty simple. Um, the code is pretty manageable. Later on, we also launched the messages jewel, which shows you the number of threads that have unseen messages on them. That was kind of developed independently from the chat tab. But whenever a new message comes in, we also want to handle that unseen count. So this code gets a little bit more complicated. We have an unseen um, thread count that we want to bump every time we get a new message. And if we think that the user is looking at it, we also want to decrement it. A couple months later, we also introduced the larger messages view. And with that, we made this handler even more complicated. This is what we had before. And now we have to sort of account for the messages view and decrement the count under the right conditions if we think the user is looking at either one of the views. So what are the problems here? One is that the code is, has, really has no structure. Um, it's very imperative. That makes it fragile. And we lose a lot of the original intents behind it. It's hard to tell just by looking at the code that you want to keep the messages view and the chat tab view in sync. It's hard to tell that you only want to increment and then decrement. You don't want to do either of those more than once. And you know, as we add more features, this code just only gets longer. And having something imperative like this basically led us to the situation where we had our most annoying chat bug happen over and over. They would, users would get an unseen count, and there would be no unseen messages behind it. Back to our to-do example. Let's see how this code looks in React. JSX is almost identical to HTML. The only difference is that we can use React state as variables directly inside the markup, and we can get rid of all unnecessary IDs. We still need an event handler, but it's so much simpler. We just update the list of to-dos. So in React, we say what we want, and it does the rest for us. One thing is that it saves us from typing all those explicit DOM operations, Another is that by decoupling state from the DOM, it can be minimized to one simple array. And we just use derivative values in the JSX, so we don't need to update each place separately. Our benefits. Event handlers become much more concise, and the surface for making errors shrinks. It's also easier to track how state transitions over time, because with DOM operations, you might access the same DOM node with many different selectors. 
by ID, class, attribute, tag. So each time you modify something, you either have to keep all of those places in your head or go through the tedious process of checking all possible selectors in the code. But in React, you can simply search by set state phrase because that's the only function that can actually change the state. We should do our utmost to shorten the conceptual gap between the static program and the dynamic process so that uh, to make the correspondence between the program and the process as trivial as possible. Now, what Dijkstra is saying here is he's saying we need to take this series of imperative mutations, these things that are changing over time, and try to make it look like a program that executes at a single point in time. State changing over time looks simpler in React, just as Dijkstra wanted. It shortens the gap between static programs and dynamic processes. Then there is a final question. What seniors know that juniors don't? Declarative becomes more useful when complexity grows. And it's pretty obvious once you remember that declarative stems from abstraction. There is no need for abstraction if you have a single simple use case. But as you add more and more code, the benefits suddenly become obvious. And declarative is often discussed in a very simplified environment, because there is only a finite amount of complexity that you can fit into an online article or a single YouTube video. That's why a lot of junior devs might initially struggle to understand its usefulness. But the declarative nature of React was born out of complexity. And when React first came out, there was initial pushback because a lot of people didn't understood the necessity of abstraction. We announced uh, the open sourcing at JSConf US in May, and we got some sarcastic reactions to it. Uh, th this tweet was, was not a compliment. The declarative nature comes at a cost. In React's case, it's the constant rendering on every update and the implementation of virtual DOM to mitigate this. Sounds like unnecessary abstraction, but when the first companies started adopting it for larger projects... Um, today, we have Tony Kasparo, who's going to be talking a lot about our latest uh, redesign of the website. It became clear it handles complexity well. And developers no longer had to use their, I'm joking, <laughs> they no longer had to focus on DOM operations, they could focus on business logic. And that's why React stayed and became popular. At least, that's my take. And this is a not sponsored recommendation of this week in React. Sebastian actually shared a couple of my videos, so I just want to return a favor. And I'm actually a subscriber myself. There is a ton, a ton of useful information every week. I enjoy it myself, so I'm pretty sure that if you are watching my channel, you will enjoy it too. And by the way, thanks for watching.